Welcome to Issues That Matter. My guest today is Scott Ritter and Diane Sayre, and Diane is a candidate for the United States Senate. So um, let's let's go back a little bit and talk about uh, the ballot access. It was Andrew Cuomo who raised the bar from 15,000 signatures to 45,000. Can you give our viewers a little overview of exactly why that was done, in your opinion? Um, well, why it was done is to make sure there's no dissent. If you're going to plunge the nation into potential nuclear war and economic collapse, then it behooves the ruling parties, which seem to have the one area they agree is on plunging us into war, um, to make sure there's no dissent and to make sure that there is no uh, voice of opposition or anyone who could raise any questions. And I actually put out a statement asking whether the suppression of my campaign is the prelude to nuclear war. Um, now, their claimed, their alleged excuse for this is that they are creating a $100 million slush fund for matching funds in the US elections. And um, they said that they are so concerned about the taxpayers' money. I know many New Yorkers may not realize it, but the legislature uh, purports to be very concerned about how they spend your money. And therefore, they don't want to waste any matching funds on frivolous, they use the word frivolous candidates. Now, as a federal candidate, I am not even eligible for these matching funds. And the matching funds don't even kick in until 2024. But nonetheless, they tripled the petitioning requirement. And I will tell you, the 15,000 signatures was already so onerous. You might remember when John McCain was running for president. He was a major Republican Party candidate. He was unable to even get the 15,000. So they take something that's already difficult and tripled it. And as a result, the Libertarian Party, which has actually won 107 different elections in New York over years, the Green Party, which has won a number of elections, long established minority parties, uh -huh. neither of them was able to get this requirement. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it turned out that I was the only person in the state who was able to get on the ballot through this outrageous method. And I did submit 66,000 signatures, and they were of a high enough quality that no one even challenged them. When your campaign first reached out to me, and they told me that you had gone to those number of signatures, I thought, wow, Howie Hawkins, who's been involved in politics in New York State for many years, who's running on the Green Party line for governor this year, he wasn't even able to come close to that. And I'm thinking, if Howie can't do it, how did Diane do it? So can you give us a, a little overview of how you did it? I mean, that's a taunting figure. Well, uh, you know, I have to tell you, I actually don't like the way I did it because I only had 200 volunteers and I had wanted to get four or 500 um, because we knew we had no room for error and we couldn't be below 2000 signatures any day because there's a time limit. So people mm -hmm. had to work very, very hard. I had the advantage, as you know, of having worked with Lyndon LaRouche for 30 years, and we had successfully gotten him on the ballot twice in New York. So there were a handful of older stalwarts, because the last time I think was the 2000 election, so that was quite a while ago. But we had a handful of people who knew the crazy, legal, picky details who were able to help. Um, but it was largely a new network of volunteers. And I told them at the beginning, I said, you can't pay people for this. I'm not hiring petitioning firms because what we're going to have to do is impossible. 
And therefore, you're not going to clock in and clock out. There's not going to be a time when you can cut. You can't say, I'm not doing it because it's raining or it's snowing. I mean, the first day of petitioning was April 19th. I was on my way to Buffalo and they had these big signs over the road, heavy snow <laughs> expected. So the first day we're in a snowstorm and you couldn't, you had to get the 2000 signatures every day or not make it. And we made a focus actually nuclear war. When people would ask the petitioners or ask me, well, what does she stand for? I would say, I stand for that we are in danger of a nuclear war and that's not a good policy and it's not gonna balance the budget. And, and then often also interestingly, people would say, what party? Independent, I'm not with the parties, I'm with LaRouche. And they'd say, oh, thank God, I just left X party. I just left the Democratic party. I just left the Republican party. I'm so fed up. Um, and I think it was that message and also the realization among my supporters that we have a real danger that they were willing to go the extra mile. I mean, it really wasn't easy. They had all these crazy things. Imagine they used COVID as an excuse for why you can't stand in front of a store and petition. So grocery stores that we've been able to do 20 years ago, you'd go there talk to the manager and they'd say, oh no, sorry, our headquarters said since COVID, no one is allowed to be in front of the grocery store. <laughs> so it, it, it was just every kind of imaginable hurdle. I mean, sometimes you resorted to guerrilla tactics. You just go to one grocery store, only talk to people as they were leaving and pray that no one went in and told the management you were out there or last as long as you could and run to the next <laughs> grocery store. I mean, that's what, um, people were doing and that's how we did it. And I uh, and I know that people in the Libertarian and Green parties were actually very disappointed that I did it because they have been involved in legal cases saying that this is impossible. Yeah. Now, if I succeeded, it demonstrates that it's not impossible, but I would be the first one to join them and say it is impossible. No one should be required to do this. For six weeks, I did nothing nothing except worry about the petitioning. I did not speak at any event unless I knew I could get at least 100 signatures there. It was all consuming. We weren't able to raise funds during that time. We worked on raising a lot of money going into it. So we could, I mean, even though I didn't pay people to petition, it cost about $80,000. I had three lawyers. We had to put gas in the cars. We had to rent housing and, you know, I mean, it's just an outrageous requirement. Mm -hmm. So Scott, you were on the list as well as Diane. So share your views on the whole blacklist situation. Well, before I do that, let me let me focus on one thing that Diane spoke of. Um, the single issue that she raised to get on this list, the single issue that motivated 66,000 New Yorkers to sign their names to a petition was the danger of nuclear war. And here we are today on the brink of a nuclear conflict. I, I don't know if your listeners know this. Uh, right now, there's a, um, a NATO nuclear exercise taking place um, that is literally practicing to drop bombs on Russia. Now, Russia responded with their own nuclear weapons exercise um, that is literally practicing to drop bombs on NATO. The difference here that Russia does not have a doctrine of preemption. The United States does. Joe Biden ran for president saying that he would, one of the first things he'd do is ensure that there was a statement of sole purpose, that the only purpose of America's nuclear arsenal was for deterrence, and we would only use nuclear weapons in retaliation. Hey, Joe, what have you done? Nothing. And right now we have a situation where NATO is practicing the use of employing American nuclear weapons at a time when America has a doctrine of preemption that's been in place since the Bush administration, uncontradicted by anything this president said, and at a moment when the Ukrainian president, whom we've elevated to be, you know, the version, modern version of Winston Churchill, King Leonidas, has openly called for NATO to launch a preemptive nuclear attack against Russia as a means of deterring a Russian nuclear attack on Ukraine that no one's talking about but the West. So the reason why I bring this up is, wouldn't it be nice 
if Diane Sayre was on the stage with one of the most powerful men in America, the Senate Majority Leader, Chuck Schumer, who is singularly empowered to ask questions about national security, to stare across the desk at Joe Biden and say, what about that sole purpose statement, Joe? Wouldn't it be nice if Diane was there to represent those 66,000 New Yorkers to put their names on a piece of paper and said, this is what we believe in. This is what we want. This is important to us. And it's a discussion that should be had, not just here in New York with Diane taking the lead, but throughout America, which is why it's imperative we get people like Diane put in positions of authority where they can bring this issue to the forefront. But instead, instead, she's denied access. But it's not just denied access. She's denied access and placed on a blacklist. But it's not a blacklist. It's a hit list. It's an assassination list where she could be killed. And it's not an idle threat. There are lunatics right here in the state of New York. Ellenville, where they have a statue erected to Stepan Bandera and four other Nazi-supporting Ukrainian ultra-nationalists dating back to the Second World War. And every year they hold torchlight parades in honor of this guy. These people live here in America. We live in the day and age of political violence. And somebody like Diane Sayre, who should be on a stage with Chuck Schumer debating nuclear war and the future of the United States and the world, is instead having to worry uh, whether or not one of these lunatic fringes are going to take action because she's been put on a list funded by the United States government, supported by the United States government, sustained by the United States government. And even though we've brought it to the attention of Chuck Schumer and everybody else, they're doing nothing about it. That's the crime. Again, Diane, you, I'm not a political person, and, and I can't sit here and say, I endorse Diane Sayre for Senate. I can't do that. I wouldn't endorse anybody for Senate. But I'll tell you what, I endorse your presence on the stage. I endorse your message. And I endorse the fact that you alone seem to understand what's important to this world. And that is having a future for our children, for our grandchildren and their children and generations following the future that will deny everybody if we have a nuclear conflict. So I want you on that stage, Diane. I want you speaking out on behalf of the people of New York. And it's just a darn shame that they're silencing you in this manner.